Welcome. I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. You may recognize supermodel Giselle Bündchen from the catwalk as a cover model or as half of the ultimate power couple. We'll get to that in a moment. But as she tells our Lee Cowan, now that she's stepped back from the spotlight, she finally gets to be herself after playing a role for most of her career. But being an introvert and then becoming a supermodel seemed that like That was a very challenging thing to entirely do. Entirely opposite. But I had her. Her, yeah. Her. She saved me. Her. That's how she refers to the alluring chameleon who's been staring back at her from billboards and glossy magazine covers for decades. Why was that? Because it was so... For many reasons. It was easier to deal with criticism that way as well. You know, we need to change the hair, it's not working. We need to change the makeup or the clothes, everything is terrible. And then if you're young and this is, you're thinking I'm terrible. Later in the show, Giselle Bündchen opens up about her divorce from former NFL superstar Tom Brady. It's been about a, a year now since your divorce was finalized. Mm -hmm. Out of that darkness, what kind of light? My children are my biggest gifts and, yeah. you know, and I'm so focused on them and being the best mom that I can be. And I think both of us are really focused on how we can be the best parents for our children. And I think when you have that as your, as your main intention, that's, that's, you know, it's really helpful. You have to have an intention for everything you do in your life. Then from a supermodel to superwomen, Ms. Magazine was a revolutionary feminist voice when it was first published in the 1970s. Rather than fashion or homemaking tips, it offered women help finding their voices and using them. Rita Braver spoke to executive editor Katherine Spiller. It started trends and it amplified the trends. A lot of articles about men and marriage and relationships and child rearing and politics and violence against women. And you can trace. And keep coming back. I keep coming back. And it shows the endurance of this movement, uh, but also the endurance of our opponents. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Supermodel Giselle Bündchen started working when she was just a teenager. She says those years in front of the photographer's lens took both a physical and mental toll on her. But as she showed Lee Cowan, she's living a slower, more natural existence these days in Costa Rica. To see a sunset like this off the coast of Costa Rica takes a bit of effort. The Nicoya Peninsula is not the easiest place to get to. It's home to a beautifully chaotic town called Santa Teresa, full of expats and world-class surfers. And once we arrived, we realized that being far from everything is exactly the point, especially for the person who invited us here, Giselle Bündchen. This is a bit of a sanctuary for you, is it? Look at it. This is her home away from home, and she says the perfect place for this supermodel to find renewal. I'm in a different place in my life. I'm able to choose more of what I want. I think before I was more surviving, and now I'm living, which is different. Go get it! At 43, <laughs> a mom of two, she still has one of the most sought after looks in the business. That said though, she's largely pulling back from the runway, not because she had to, but because she says, it's now about time to show the world what all those designers and all those photographers missed, her true self. You know, they were hiring Giselle because they didn't even know me. They just liked the way I looked and they liked the way my body looked in clothes, I guess. I've done that, I understand that. And now I get to be me. And what me is, she says, is not the spotlight-loving personality you might think. I'm a cancer. I like my home. I'm a little crab. I like my little home. You know, the crab, he has a little shell. He likes to go in her shell and feel, that's me. But being an introvert and then becoming a supermodel seemed that like That was a very challenging thing to entirely do. Entirely opposite. But I had her. Her, yeah. Her. She saved me. Her. That's how she refers to the alluring chameleon who's been staring back at her from billboards and glossy magazine covers for decades. Why was that? Because it was so... For many reasons. It was easier to deal with criticism that way as well. 
you know, we need to change the hair, it's not working, we need to change the makeup or the clothes, everything is terrible. And then if you're young and this is, you're thinking I'm terrible, like I'm doing right. something wrong. So. But I can't imagine though, you know, you were 14 and people are talking about your eyes are too close or your nose is too big. I still have the same nose and the same eyes. I know that I keep <laughs> It's like, but I grew but like, into it too, you know, so it's... Uh, right, but like, that's hard to hear at any age, but if you were 13 or 14 years old... This is why the her was very important for yeah. me. It was a veneer that did shield her from the often brutal side of the fashion business while also allowing her to flourish in it. Her long list of lucrative contracts made her one of the highest paid models in the world. Seems like she had a talent for the business side of show business too. But it was between the glitz and the glamour, the rare times when she was alone that she sometimes wished she'd never been discovered at all. Everybody looked at me from the outside and thought I had it all, right? And I was yeah. feeling like I was living this life that was just like... Killing. I, I was killing, exactly. You know, drinking mocha frappuccinos for breakfast with three cigarettes, drinking a bottle of wine at night to calm down from all the coffee I was drinking, not sleeping and traveling and working. Like I basically burned down my adrenal glands and my nervous system couldn't take it anymore. I felt bad about it, you know? I felt like I couldn't tell people that because they, they looked at me and they're like, she has everything. Like, they wouldn't even understand. So when did the, how did the anxiety start to present itself? You know, I was in tunnels, I couldn't breathe. And then I started like being in studios and I felt like suffocated. I lived on the ninth floor and I had to go up the stairs because I was afraid I would be stuck on the elevator and I'd be hyperventilating. Right. Because you know, if you can't breathe, even when your windows are open, you feel like, I don't want to live like this. You know what I mean? Did you so really you, think about jumping? Yeah, for like a second, you know, because you're like, I can't. She yeah. didn't yeah. jump. Instead, she says she stopped much. everything in a single day. A complete detox, dollars. no caffeine, no sugar, yeah. hardly any alcohol. And she began a new morning ritual, meditation. You know, I wake up at five. Five. Yeah, I like to wake up early. I like to greet the sun. You know, sometimes you're tired and you're like, okay, like I'm just gonna sleep in a little bit. But I feel the difference when I do that. A few years later, when she met NFL superstar Tom Brady, she says she was a different person, happy and healthy, and looking to focus less on modeling and more on motherhood. Do you miss the spotlight though a little? No. Not at all? <laughs> no. Not at all. I was there to take my kids to school every day and mm. have make them breakfast every morning and, and just be with them and 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 just I mean what a gift. Mm. They grow up so fast and it's like that, you know? Like you wake up and you're like, what happened? She and Brady now share custody of those children. After sixteen years together, their divorce was as public as their careers. Painful for everyone, she says. And yet I look into my life and I, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't have any other life. I wouldn't have done it. If they say, could you change something in your life? I wouldn't change absolutely anything. Not even getting divorced. I mean, it's not what I dreamed of and what I, I hoped for. You know, my parents have been married for 50 years and, yeah. and I really wanted that to happen. But I think you have to accept, you know, sometimes that the way you are in your 20s, it's, you know, sometimes you, you grow together, sometimes you grow apart. I mean, he's the father of my kids, you know, so I always wish him the best, and I, I mean, I'm so grateful that he gave me wonderful children. And I think, you know, when a door shuts, other doors open. One of those doors opened onto this blooming field of place. echinacea. Yes. Nature is my happy place. Yeah. Anytime I'm in nature, I'm happy. This is the Gaia Herbs Farm, nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Western North Carolina. It's been organically growing any number of healthy herbs to be turned into supplements for nearly 40 years. And for Bunchen, it's as much a brand as it is a lifestyle. That's how I treat my kids. You know, we use edelberry syrup, like which is a huge, mm. amazing immune booster, and my kids and I love it. We always... Are your kids on board with all this? Mike, are you kidding me? My kids have been taking it since they were born, you know? <laughs> They're like, Mama, I wanna eat this food. I'm like, well, if you can tell me what that is, <laughs> then you can. She just signed on to be the wellness ambassador for Gaia Herbs. I feel like it's a combination of the journey I've been on. A role she says that's less about business and more about teaching what she calls the wisdom of plants. So there is different herbs that might have a bigger impact on your system than others, right? So you have to kind of like- Experiment a little experiment bit. It, and this is what I've done. Like I've taken, I've been taking herbal remedies pretty much all my life. She grew up in a rural town in Southern Brazil where her late grandmother had an herb garden of her own. 
Bunchen fondly remembers how what her grandmother plucked from it seemed to be able to cure almost any ailment. She was magical for me because she could fix anything. She could plant anything, she could make anything grow, she could heal anything. She was just amazing, right? She was this like, she's amazing. Sorry. <laughs> Well, you're doing her proud, that's for sure. Thank you. I'm sorry. She was so special. It's emotional, she says, because after touring the world... You like that stick, baby? <laughs> She's like, yeah, life is good. She now realizes that her ultimate destination may have always been home. I'm a small town girl. You know, you can take this girl out of the small town, but not the small town out of the girl. As a model, Giselle Bunchen called herself a silent actress. She hopes that silence, though, is now no more. I just think now is I, I'm allowing my, myself to come out as Giselle versus as her. I don't have to play a character. I can be me. And that's liberating. If you like the one <laughs> Oh, there you oh, go. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Give us a little refreshment. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from our chat with Giselle Bunchen, something you can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. You know, I'm in a place of like, I really want to be the best version of myself and I, I, I love to focus, you know, there's only 24 hours a day. So I don't get any more time than anybody else. And that 24 hours a day is very precious to me. As promised, here's more from Lee Cowan and Giselle Bunchen. Do you still get calls to model? Oh, yeah, a lot. And you just turn most of them down? Yeah, because I feel like, look, if there is a job that I feel that, you know, there is a campaign that I want to do or something that is, that I'm going to, either I like the photographer or I like the company or I've worked with them for a long time and they were supportive of me when I started and I feel like I have the opportunity to do that again and I feel nice. like, you know, I remember what they've done for me so now I can, you know what I mean? I feel yeah. like I have loyalty to people. I think that's an important thing to have. Before I became a mom, I was just doing all the jobs, right? Because, yeah. and then now I, I pick and choose the jobs. It's been about a, a year now since your divorce was finalized. Mm -hmm. Out of that darkness, what kind of light? My children are my biggest gifts. And yeah. you know, and I'm so focused on them and being the best mom that I can be. And I think both of us are really focused on how we can be the best parents for our children. And I think when you have that as your as your main intention, that's, that's, it's really helpful. You have to have an intention for everything you do in your life. And I think we're very, you know, focused on that. It does seem like though, it, you're like anyone, you'd, you're mourning something that was lost. Absolutely, because I'm human, you know? Uh, but I think that um, you can choose to look at the glass half full or the glass half empty in your life. And that's for everything, for everything that you go through in your life. And, and I had incredible, many years, 16 years of, of, you know, so many lessons and so many wonderful memories. And, and I have the most beautiful children. They're the biggest loves of my life. And I'm so grateful for that. And I think in the end of the day, it's like, imagine if this wouldn't have happened, I would have never had that. Do you think you're entering a more private part of your life now? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. And you well, want that? Well, it's just not even private. I just think I like, you know, I'm in a place of like, I really want to be the best version of myself and I, I, I love to focus, you know, there's only 24 hours a day, so I don't get any more time than anybody else. And that 24 <laughs> hours a day is very precious to me. So I would say I'm more selective about everything because, you know, I'm also in my 40s. I mean, I'm probably half my life. I don't have that. I mean, I feel like I want to no, do I a lot of things. I feel like I want to live like, yet. hopefully I live until I'm 100, but there's, you know. But I think, you know, choose wisely the people you allow into your life, choose wisely the conversations you have, because, you know, the things you read, everything, because that all of that creates the quality of your life. Up next, more than 50 years of Ms. Welcome back. When journalist and activist Gloria Steinem launched Ms. Magazine in the 1970s, women were fighting for equality. Abortion was a hot button issue, and talking about workplace harassment was taboo. Rita Braver looks back at more than 50 years of Ms., how far feminism has come, and how far there's still to go. What do we want? Equality! When do we want it? Now! 
As the women's liberation movement was picking up steam more than half a century ago, feminism, the idea of equality for women, was a new and controversial idea. Why do you think that word seemed to threaten people, the word feminism? Two reasons. One, because they didn't understand it. And two, because they did understand it. <laughs> now 89, Gloria Steinem was a 30-something columnist for New York Magazine when she joined with a group of other journalists to create a new magazine aiming to push feminism into the mainstream. Even the title, Ms., a newly emerging designation for those who didn't want to be bound by Mrs. for a married woman or Miss for a single woman, was an issue. As I understand it, even the New York Times wouldn't call you Ms. Gloria Steinem. Oh, no, no. I'm so glad you know that. It was so <laughs> annoying because for years and years I was Miss Steinem of Ms. Magazine. <laughs> Ms. would not offer household hints or fashion tips like traditional women's magazines. We wanted to be able to write about trying to make an equal marriage or to write about abortion. We didn't want to just focus on women's outsides, but also our insides. In fact, Steinem says she became an activist as well as a journalist while covering an abortion hearing. And suddenly I realized, wait a minute, I had an abortion when I was in London, and why has this common experience not been spoken about? So in the very first issue of Ms., we had a massive petition signed by, you know, all kinds of people saying, I have had Some an abortion. Some 50 prominent women yes. signed it. I have had an abortion, and I demand that it become safe and legal. And, of course, we're still fighting this battle in some states. Amid fears about how Ms. would be received, Steinem's boss, legendary New York publisher Clay Felker, volunteered to publish a sample issue within the pages of his magazine. Steinem and the Ms. team hit the publicity circuit. And when I got to California, somebody called the radio show I was on and said, you know, we can't find it. And I called Clay Felker in a panic, and I said, it didn't get here. It didn't. And it turned out it had sold out. That was a moment of recognition that, you know, it had an audience. An audience that's lasted more than 50 years. This is from the early 70s, spring. Catherine Spiller, executive editor of Ms., spent two and a half years compiling an anthology. They all want to make you just dive in, yes, <laughs> right? Yes. It's immodestly <laughs> subtitled The Pathfinding Magazine That Ignited a Revolution. It started trends, and it amplified the trends. A lot of articles about men and marriage and relationships and child rearing and politics and violence against women, and you can trace... That keep coming back. That keep coming back. And it shows the endurance of this movement, uh, but also the endurance of our opponents. Published monthly, there were lots of Wonder Woman covers and stories about women's emerging political clout. One of the most popular features has been letters from readers. Here's a great one. It's very funny. My husband says I used to be a bitch once a month, but since I subscribed to Ms., now I'm a bitch twice a month. <laughs> The letters often end with the word click, inspired by one of the earliest articles by Ms. co-founder Jane O'Reilly, describing the moment a woman realizes she's experiencing sexism. It's really become part of the vernacular even today. It's an automatic uh, connection to other women who are suffering the same injustices. Long before the Me Too movement, Ms. was writing about sexual harassment on the job. The editors at the time had to use a doll. Uh, because to it show. would have been too outrageous right. over the top to have a real woman there. Exactly. And as it was, a lot of newsstands pulled this off, refusing to sell the issue. But it absolutely represented what way too many women in the workplace experienced then and now. And selling advertising for a women's magazine that covered these issues became a challenge. 
You describe a lunch with the head of a major cosmetics company in which he told you that women who read Ms. didn't buy blush or makeup? Right. Took me to lunch to tell me that, yes. <laughs> right. Car manufacturers didn't want to advertise because they didn't think women bought cars? And that it would devalue a car to see a woman driving it. I mean, they told me that in Detroit. I didn't, I'm not making it up. <laughs> in 2002, Ms. started being published by the nonprofit Feminist Majority Foundation. Today, Ms. is a quarterly and still inspiring young women, according to Ileana McDonald, who works for the foundation. So to the question that some people have, which is, hey, is this 50 plus magazine still relevant? What's your answer? Absolutely. Um, it's relevant now for the same reason it was relevant back in the 70s, because it's providing a platform. It's encouraging discourse that still needs to be encouraged. It has been 50 years, but we still have a lot of work to do. All of us must stand up together and say no more. Ms. co-founder Gloria Steinem couldn't agree more. Are you still optimistic about the push yes. for equality? Yes. We have to imagine something before it becomes reality. So yes, I am a hopeaholic. <laughs>